We good to go? All righty. How's everybody doing tonight? Yeah. Woo! Thanks for coming out. Some people said they're just doing okay, but that's okay. I'm going anyways. Uh, so this talk is called Hacking in High School, talking about inspiring the next generation of security professionals. So every good talk starts with an introduction. Who am I? My accomplishments, all the stuff that I've done so far, why I'm legit, and you should listen to me and pay attention. Well, I'm actually not going to start with that. I'm sorry. I'm just going to talk about, this is a, a talk that I'm going to talk about a little bit about my background, who I am, what I've done, and how I'm going to get to the next step, and my experiences dealing with information security, uh, developing an information security program primarily for high schools. So before I introduce myself with all that stuff, let me do a flashback. So pretend the year is not 2017, the year is now 2007, okay? So 2007, think back to where you were, close your eyes for a second, back. All right, we're back in 27, 2007. So here's me in 2007. I'm still in high school, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to do with my life, right? You have to do this from your career counselor in high school. You have teachers. They say, all right, you're in high school now. You've got to figure out what you're doing with your life. Well, I say, okay, I'll do that. I like computers. Okay, well, cool. <laughs> Me too. Right on. Okay, so the teacher says, well, I don't know what a computer is, so you're going to have to do some research to figure out what you're going to do with this thing that they call a computer. So I was like, okay, I like problem solving. Well, so that's cool. I understand that. You do math, you do science, you do physics, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, well... That's all right. I, I well, but I like building and breaking stuff too. I don't just want to like write stuff on paper and read books and do research and sit in a lab at midnight when no one's around and wondering what I'm doing. I want to like make something, right? I want to build it. I want to break it. I want to figure out how it works so I can talk to other people who actually care about it. So, what are some careers for me? What what options do I have me as a high school student who likes those sort of things? Well, most teachers told me I should be a developer, I should be maybe a sysadmin, I should go into sales but have like some technical knowledge behind it so I can be really good at technical sales. And to be honest, none of those really appealed to me. So uh, what we had to do as part of this project is I had to interview someone who was in the industry I wanted to be and ask him or her, how did you get there? Uh, what did you do to get there? Uh, what are some things that you could recommend to me looking to get into that field? So I was really excited, right? I was like, this is going to be cool. I like breaking things, hacking things, downloading cheats for my favorite games, you know, Counter-Strike, stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to ask somebody, uh, it was a friend of a friend, and I sent out some emails with my parents' permission on AOL, and I asked them, how did you get into security? And so uh, I'm not saying that these answers were for everyone in 2007, but these are the general themes that me as a high schooler, that's what I heard from people in the industry. So I'm going to preface this with a disclaimer. may not be accurate. I know some people might say that, oh, I don't think like that. Well, this is the answers that I got. So first of all, they said, you're definitely going to need a technical degree, right? Don't even think about getting in security unless you have at least a four-year degree. You need that bachelor's degree. So before you get into security, you're going to need three to five years of help desk experience, right? You don't get into security right off the bat. You've got to get three to five years, you know, understanding people, helping people, paying your dues right at the help desk level, fixing people, people's computers, uh, figuring out why their passwords expired and why it doesn't work and why they need to reset it to something. So you need those years of help desk experience before you get into security. So after you do that, well, maybe then you can be a sysadmin. So uh, between three to five years, again, as a sysadmin. So now you're at the level, so you're organizing the help desk, and you're helping people fix maybe bigger problems, right? You have an understanding of network fundamentals and patching and all those good stuff that go into it. So you can't just jump in because that would be silly, right? You need that experience. I mean, we're talking, you know, six to ten years before you actually get some experience enough to do security. So 
Well, before you get into a security role, then you need to have some experience actually managing people. So the managerial experience. So in my head, I'm kind of thinking and I'm adding up, the, up these numbers and they're not really complicated numbers to add up, right? Three plus three plus three plus three. Oh man. Oh geez. I'm going to be like 40 before I start doing the security stuff. Now, sorry for those of you who are 40 and above, but to me as a high schooler at 16 and 17, right, that just felt like forever. And I was like, I can't do that. So uh, the other thing that this, uh, these people told me, they said that certifications, guaranteed ticket. Once you get these certifications, like for instance, the MCSE, if you guys remember what that was like, that, the kind of bubble of the MCSE, they said, that's your golden ticket. If you can get that, you'll be set and you'll definitely be able to guarantee to get a job making over $100,000 a year. Congratulations. Now you're qualified to be in information security. So some of those trends, depending on the organization, sometimes you see some of those still, uh, but largely we have a lot of differences now in 2017. The industry has really kind of evolved and adapted, and so some of those practices are still there, but they're not there 100%. So here's some of the changes that I've seen uh, getting into the industry in 2017. So a degree really helps, right? A degree helps you get your foot in the door. It helps you bypass that HR filter. It helps you uh, have some legitimacy in your accomplishments. It shows that you can write and read and think critically. And I'm not knocking degrees at all by any means. I do have a degree. But in, in, in what we call this talent shortage that people are talking about, uh, I've seen companies more willing to take someone who has talent and train them up. I just got done talking with somebody who is the uh, lead security engineer for a large company, and he doesn't even have a bachelor's degree, but he knows his stuff, and he's able to provide value to that uh, company in ways that maybe the, the board hasn't really thought about before. And I think that's pretty cool in terms of the security industry. So experience is good, right? It's good to have that experience, that sysadmin, that help desk, understanding those network fundamentals. Those are huge in your job as security. However, that experience formally defined in your job role is really good to have, but it's possible that you have people coming to security from unrelated fields. In fact, I'm actually one of those people, and I'm going to get to that in just a second, but it's possible for people like me to get into security without maybe having 10 to 15 years of IT experience. So certifications, before I, I kind of heard this trend that certifications were like the gold standard, right? Certifications are the end all be all. You have a cert, you're it, it's golden. And so now we hear a lot more debate as to the value of certifications. And I'm not gonna open up that can of worms in particular, um, but there's a lot of talk in the InfoSec community about certifications and whether or not they're actually helpful. Does it actually encourage the hacker mindset and understanding, or is it just memorizing vocabulary? How valuable actually are these certifications? So there's a lot more debate as to the validity of those. And I think the job titles have kind of changed. We have a lot more specialties. Uh, having SOC analysts, uh, incident response people, penetration testers, reverse engineers, those are all becoming a lot more common, whereas you might have only seen those in really niche markets before. Um, the specialties, the, the defense contractors and things like that, pretty much having to guarantee that you live or work in the Richmond, Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. But that's really not that true anymore. So uh, just kind of a brief little uh, table here, comparing and contrasting. Again, this is general trends, and this is my subjective experience. So take it for what you will. But the old school way of thinking is that you have to pay your dues with that years of experience. But in the new school, because we have this gap of talent that we're trying to fill these jobs, you're able to jump in if you can show that you are uh, able to do those things that the job requires. And before we always thought that, you know, we always have done these things this way. This is the process that we always follow, so we have to follow this. Well, now we kind of do things different and strange and think outside the box, and, and that's becoming more and more okay. Before you had a few dedicated sectors that are doing it, the defense contractors, um, the, the big players in the industry, and now you have these small organizations, these boutique firms popping up. You see retail and energy. They're starting to get red teams and things that you, you might not have seen in 2007. 
And lastly, the cert certifications. Everyone was generally of the agreement that if you have a certification, you have the expertise. And now it's, it's maybe up for debate as to whether or not these certifications actually capture the mindset of what's required to succeed in an information security role. Okay, so let me talk about my journey in particular. And I alluded to that just to kind of give you some background. I am a non-traditional person coming into security. So a little bit about my journey. I did end up going to college. I decided to go to college. I went to college in Grove City. Uh, that's in Pennsylvania, about an hour, hour and a half from here. I studied physics and computer science. And so I graduated in 2012. And I was thinking about what I wanted to do, and I really wasn't sure. I didn't want to go to grad school, and I didn't want to do research. And I didn't really want to be a developer, and I wasn't sure that I, I had enough patience to deal with people in the help desk. So I decided that I was going to go into teaching. And I know that sounds ironic, because I just said I didn't have the patience to deal with people in the help desk. But I decided to go into teaching through a program called the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Program. And so what it does, it tries to get people who have technical knowledge uh, in the sciences and math and things like that and get them into the classroom. It's a really great program and I'm happy to be a part of it, uh, but it allowed me through the University of Akron to earn my master's degree in education. So I was able to, uh, through that program, actually get involved in the classroom. So now you take a person who has the kind of uh, technical skills that I, that I earned in my undergraduate degree and then try and apply those in a high school. And so that's where this talk is kind of going to start. What does it look like for someone who knows technical things to show up and then see how things are done in a 712 Ohio high school? So... Uh, once I graduated from that program, I did a year of student teaching in Canton, and I actually taught at Brexville Broadview Heights High School. Anybody know where that is? It's about, yeah, there, yeah. are you an alum? Yeah. Look at that. We got some alum in the audience. Okay, so it's about uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes south of downtown Cleveland, uh, but Brexville Broadview Heights High School is a large high school. Um, they are and a national blue ribbon school for whatever that means according to the state report card so uh, i taught for three years in high school i taught uh, lots of different science classes so i taught mostly physics um, i taught physics i taught integrated science for uh, freshmen I, I, now I wanted to teach computer science, but I'm going to get to that in a little bit. I, there are some obstacles in my way that prevented me from doing so. So I taught high school for three years, and while I was teaching high school, I was doing these after-school programs. I was doing, instead of it during the day, I would have these programming and information security and cyber patriot and all of those things that I'm going to get to in a little bit. I was doing those after school, and I started to realize I really enjoyed hacking. It was a lot of fun, and, and I always played around with this stuff on my own without any real guidance, and all the people that I talked to in my life who were like, I, I really like hacking, I want to do it, I really like hacking, how do I get to where you are? They kind of give me these runaround answers like, oh, that's cool, man, but yeah, it's going to take you a while, so pay your dues first and then get there. Well, me being kind of the punk that I was, I said, well, whatever, I'm going to try the OSCP. So I did some research online, and I read the internet, and I read all the forums, and I asked Reddit, and I said, what's the best certification that you can get because I want to get into security? And people said, well, there's lots of certifications you can get, but the OSCP is a beast. If you can do it, it shows that you have some amount of skill. Well, I took it, and it was, in fact, a beast, and it was uh, maybe one of the hardest things, I think, that I've ever done in my life, but I was able to successfully complete that, and finally, uh, after I completed that, so I was able to get a position at the company called Secure State, which is a Cleveland-based information security management consultant company. So that's my journey to security, and it's a little weird, right, when you think about the traditional trajectory, but I just wanted to give you that background and pretext to how I got in a high school classroom and what I'm still trying to do to help the high school 7 through 12 programs in Ohio. So the reaction I got when I was trying to get there, so wait a second, you went from teaching to security? Haha, <laughs> oh wow, or as they say, 
LOL, which means laugh out loud. That's the experience that I imagined that people got when I submitted my resume. My resume has three years of teaching, a bachelor's degree, the OSCP, eh, he's a teacher, he's too hard to teach. So that's the reaction that I got a lot. And that's kind of interesting, right? But it was really hard for me to sell myself figuratively, uh, to security companies knowing, showing that I know something about security when I had the background that I did. So there are two main things that I learned in my job search trying to get from education into security. The two main things that I learned, if you take anything away from this talk, two adjectives, persistence and creativity. I had to do persistence, had to use persistence and creativity for everything that I did in my job search as part of the OSCP lab, as part of everything else that I did. So what do I mean by persistence? So persistence. Well, just like you have to try on the OSCP exam, they say you have to try harder. Those of you who haven't done it, it's you ask for help and they say, try harder. Oh, well, that's frustrating, right? That's annoying. It's frustrating. You don't understand what it means, but they're trying to develop that persistence and that hacker mindset. In the security world, if you give up right away when you start something, you're not going to get very far in the industry. If you look at something that says, wow, this is confusing and hard, I'm done. You're not going to do well in security. But it was one of those things that I had to learn about that persistence, you need to try and try and try again. And it's funny because that's the stuff that I would tell my students, but then when you actually do it for yourself, you feel kind of hypocritical, right? Because you feel like giving up and when you tell your student, come on, just do this physics problem, I know you can do it, and they're like, come on, Mr. Bennett, you're crazy, this is too hard. And then I go home to the OSCP lab and I say, wow, this is too hard. I feel like giving up. Well, it kind of gave me a little bit of motivation, so I wasn't as hypocritical as I was hoping to be. So uh, the other thing is creativity. So instead of just trying and trying and trying again the same way, you have to be creative. You have to find new ways, right? You have to find new ways to be able to, first of all, pop these boxes, but you have to find new ways to try and uh, network your way into the security industry, right? Both of those things are applicable. So again, with the persistence column, I had to apply frequently, right? I didn't get into the security industry by putting in one application and then walking away and saying, no, I suck. I'm done, I had to apply frequently, right? That's that persistence mechanism. Actually, uh, at Secure State, I applied more than once, and I had more than one interview, and they told me no at first, but I had to try and try and try again. So I had to be a little creative as well. So I had to explain my story, right? I talked about that resume that had education and all these things on it, physics, research, how does that apply to security? So I had to be creative in how I present myself and how I explain my story and who I am. Again, persistence, I had to show that I was able to self-study, right? If you're gonna succeed in the security industry, you've gotta be able to study on your own. You have to be able to do that type of activity in order to develop that kind of intellectual maturity that's required to keep up with this fast changing, fast paced industry. But you also have to be creative, right? So I had to try and find projects that I can commit to. So I tried my best to make sense of all these things on GitHub with all of these people who knew way more than me, trying to figure out what's something that I can contribute to that will actually provide value to the community. So with persistence last time, uh, I had to dedicate some alone time, right? I had to make time specifically just for security learning. But I also had to be creative about it. I couldn't just sit in my hole, in my war room, just by myself. I had to be creative and be intentional about networking. I couldn't sit, you know, just alone and, and, and talk on IRC with people. I had to actually go out and meet people. And so I went to different meetup groups. I went to NeoISF and GiveSec and things like that. And it was kind of uncomfortable for me because it's weird because everybody else is in their company silos and, you know, this company's here and this company's there. And then I sit at the table and it's like, oh, you're at the wrong table. But I actually didn't feel like that uh, in the course of doing it. So it was a good exercise for me to get creative and get outside the box with that. So uh, I had to be intentional about my networking. 
So I actually did end up passing my OSCP. Um, it was a, definitely a difficult challenge. But as part of the offensive security blog, as soon as I was done with it, they had a contest to write and talk about your experience. So I did send in a blog. And I don't mean for this to be humble braggy, but I want to point out something that I did say. Uh, I did win the contest, and they sent me a net hunter phone, and it was super cool and everything like that. But one of the things that they liked, apparently, uh, in the blog that I want to point out, is, which is kind of driving where I'm going next. I said that the OSCP totally changed my perspective on learning. I said that the I have personally experienced the simple truth that learning is directly correlated with effort. And I think that's a good takeaway. Um, if you're a high school student or a college student right now, the amount of learning you get out of something is equal to or greater than the amount that you put into something. You can't expect to get knowledge and security wizardry out of something by not trying, right? It takes that persistence, it takes that creativity, it takes putting effort into it in order to get something out of it. So let me talk and switch gears a little bit about right now. So now that you kind of have understand where I'm coming from, let's talk about the state of hacking in high school. So I went to a conference and the founder from code.org, how many of you guys are familiar with the National Day of Code? Anyone familiar? Okay. So what that is, it's an initiative um, that they're trying to get every high school to spend one hour per year as like a national hour of code. And so that could be any form. It could be Python. It could be um, C++. It could be Java. It could be you know web programming. Um, they're just trying to get that introduced in the high school to try and change the culture from within. So here's an interesting statistic the, the uh, founder of code.org provided. So all these statistics are his statistics. I am properly citing that resource. So 93% of parents want their students to learn computer science principles. But only 40% of schools in Ohio currently teach it. And that's a huge gap, right? 93% of parents, right? Almost 9 out of 10, 9.5 out of 10 parents that you ask, do you want your student to learn how to program, how to learn networking fundamentals, how to hack? They say yes, but we don't have the infrastructure in place in our high schools to do it. So in my experience, I was certified to teach physics and math. Anything from grade 7 to 12, I still currently have an active teaching credential. I wanted to be able to teach computer science, the AP computer science, and lead them towards that path of, you know, discovering how much fun it is to hack legally, right? To break stuff, understand how it works, and do fun stuff with that. I want them to see that passion that I had for the computer science and transfer it over to them. Well, unfortunately, teaching computer science in high school, at least in the state of Ohio right now, is extremely complicated. Now, I had a technical bachelor's degree, a master's degree in education, and I was licensed to teach math and physics for grades 7 through 12, and there was not a clear path for someone like me to pick up the certification for computer science. And I just want to draw attention to that fact. If you know people uh, in the Department of Education or in the industry, that needs to change. There needs to be a clear path to get people who have the skills that are needed to teach this in high school and get them actually in the high school. As it turns out in the state of Ohio, uh, if you have a uh, math or business apps degree that was before a certain year, they would actually grandfather you in to be able to teach in computer science. And that's not a knock on those teachers, but a lot has changed in computer science principles. Well, maybe not the principles, but a lot has changed in computer science and especially information security since that time. So what happens now in that 40% of high schools, you have a lot of teachers who maybe aren't familiar uh, with the current trends in security and current trends in development frameworks and current trends really even in languages. But they're grandfathered into it through this process. So some of the challenges that I've uh, faced with that, parents, teachers, IT staff, you name it, anyone in a high school, the majority of people are kind of uncomfortable with the H word. And I'm not talking about the one that ends in hockey sticks. I'm talking about the one that ends in hacking, right? If you say hacking, and I go to the parents and I say, we're going to teach you how to hack. Whoa! 
hold on, I don't want my student doing that. What is this hacking thing you speak of, right? So I had to make everyone sign a waiver in my clubs. Uh, It was called an information security club, and I had to be very particular and dance around that. There are a few minor incidents that I kind of had to deal with because parents, teachers, staff, whatever, were uncomfortable with having a hacking club. Now, maybe people at this conference, you guys are all familiar with calling yourselves hackers, saying you want to hack devices, saying hacking is a good thing, but the general trend in education is maybe that's not such a good thing. So it's up to us to try and change that conversation and change that culture. So another thing that I see in high school, there's an emphasis on standardized multiple choice tests. The students who come out of high school knowing the most out of computer science, their ability is measured by their ability to take a multiple choice exam at the end of the year. Right? Now, those of you who are programmers, developers, InfoSec professionals, when's the last time you really had to submit a multiple choice assessment for a client, for your boss, something like that? It just doesn't happen, right? There's lots of uh, focus on that because it's easy to standardize things, but there's not a lot of emphasis on critical thinking. Now, some teachers do that well, but the end result and end product of these programs is just the ability to take a multiple choice test. Now, I'm going to leave that in parentheses to sound familiar. You can draw your own conclusions from that. I am not saying anything either way about any certification, but that's a common thing that we see in high school, and it sort of bleeds into the industry, right? We see some multiple choice tests that maybe measure your base understanding, but doesn't go deep as you need it to. So I'll leave that there for you to ponder on your own. So while there's nothing out there, there's no information security curriculum, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do it live. I'm just going to make it up as I go, and I'm going to fly the plane as I'm building it. So here's a little bit about my story as I was trying to build this program basically from scratch. So I had to get back and drill down to the basics. So what did I like about InfoSec? Okay, so I figured if I can make a program that I liked, that other students would like it too. I always liked InfoSec. I always had fun doing Wi-Fi stuff and like I said, the cheat codes and stuff like that online and Counter-Strike and all those goofy little things I probably shouldn't have been doing, but it really taught me a lot about how I learn. So here's some things that I liked about InfoSec that really attracted me to it that I tried to emulate in my classroom. I liked tinkering. I liked seeing new things, seeing new tools that come out, seeing how they work, and seeing what I can do to make them do stuff that's not intended to do. I also like open-ended learning. I hated the fact that in my high school that I had to follow the curriculum and maybe someday I can talk about the fun stuff for one week at the end of a chapter, right? Hopefully you guys can relate to that, but I wanted to keep things open-ended. Instead of saying, this is the defined way to do things, I'm just going to do it and keep it open-ended. I also like the stunt hacking. I will admit, you know, I liked all of the stunt hacking. I know a lot of people have mixed feelings about the stunt hacking stuff. What I mean by stunt hacking is like, someone's like, oh, I took control of a Jeep and I made it drive off a cliff. Well, it turns out they connected and associated to the access, wireless access point or something. You know, I, I like that kind of stuff and I thought it was interesting and it really grabbed people's attention. And so for better or for worse, I thought stunt hacking was fun and a really good opportunity to get people uh, interested in security because that's part of how I got interested. So I wanted to make people get interested in that way too. And of course, the underground cool factor. Um, you know, hacking just kind of has this punk connotation to it a little bit still, right? You know, you think of the hackers and you think of the movies and media and the depiction of hackers as these people who kind of do what they want whenever they want. And that, to me, appealed to me. So how do I take these things and bring them into a high school classroom legally? Well, here's what I did. So I took what I like and I tried to model it. So I like the tinkering with gadget stuff, so what I did is I bought all kinds of stuff. And thankfully for the state of Ohio's you know, teaching tax credit, I was able to purchase things like Arduinos and Teensy devices and Wi-Fi pineapples. And I kind of did that on my own. 
And it was a lot of fun because they got to figure out how they worked, some of the things that they can do. And we got to make labs out of it that really I didn't have a curriculum for, but I did them anyways. So keeping things open-ended on that same note, I didn't have a plan necessarily in that there are specific learning targets for each activity. I just wanted to see how far we can go if I can get kids excited and make something cool, right? So the plans change basically on what they felt like. When we felt like we've exhausted all the Arduino stuff, or Raspberry Pi stuff, we moved on to something different. And that's okay, right? As a teacher, it, I had to get away from, this is my lesson plan, this is the curriculum, these are the standards I have to hit, versus actually letting kids learn the way that your brains are designed to learn. Crap. So, um, anyways, we, we pretty much had to rely on word of mouth to get that out there. So some of the word roadblocks that I had, I had to find time to do it, and I had to work within the confines of a lockdown school environment, right? I was like, am I the only one that's doing this? And is it the right thing to do to have high schoolers learn how to do this? So if you do this in a high school, I recommend that you actually interact with your IT team before you do it. So some of the things that we did, and this is uh, where I'm going to wrap up, we did the uh, NYU's CSAW Forensics Challenge, which is awesome. We did the Cyber Patriot, which is sponsored by the Air Force Association, and we actually did our own CTF competition. So for the Forensics Challenge, basically what you did is you recovered an image of an SD card, and you had to find information about a killer and how he did that. Well, that's a little morbid for high schoolers, but it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Cyber Patriot, that's kind of like when you're the first day on an IT job. The room's on fire, and you have to set your computer up in the best possible way so it's secure. Terrible name, by the way, Cyber Patriot, just for the record. Um, so this is a picture of my students. Uh, this is They say that smell and scent are the highest uh, memory indicators for you. So uh, I, there's pictures of uh, anonymously named chips and drinks uh, for you there. But uh, these are my students working on the Cyber Patriot program. It was a huge mess. It was not something that you typically see in a classroom. But it was awesome for their learning because they learn how to do stuff the hard way by themselves on their own, putting in that effort. So this is a map of all the teams that do the Cyber Patriot. And ours, you can see Brexel Broadview Heights, we're right up there. So there are six teams in Ohio in the actual public high schools that do it, and the rest are part of ROTC or JROTC. So uh, some lessons that we learned. We learned that Linux was difficult, but we actually did end up going to the state competition. We actually ended up, and this is where I'll close, we ended up making our own Capture the Flag competition because we liked this stuff too much. We called it Neo CTF, and it was originally supposed to be friends and family, but apparently it got out on some mailing list or something. So we had over 500 teams register for this. So it was a good learning experience for all my students, but it was also a good learning experience for me. So you can see some of the things, no bugs admin, improve your programming skills. That was me trying to fight with Docker to try and get it to revert on a normal, regular schedule, um, but eventually people People did say that it was an awesome event and really good for their students. So uh, here's some of the things, and this is where I'm going to close. Sorry for going over. Um, so I, I, I envision a cybersecurity type of task force to get this into K through 12 schools. The state of Utah, they actually have university and industry partnerships that they work towards developing curriculum and getting industry leaders into high school classrooms, which is amazing because teachers want this, but they don't know how to get it. So I think that's an option, awesome option, and I'll talk more about that in depth if you want to talk with me outside. Um, so getting inside those classrooms, developing those partnerships, and uh, the NSA actually does something called Gen Cyber Hacker Summer Camps. So uh, interestingly enough, Ohio is the only state or one of the only states that does not do these events. So I think that should change, and people here who maybe have some knowledge or understanding.